Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today's reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 13 to 38. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up and with a gesture began to speak. You Israelites and others who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our ancestors and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted arm he led them out of it. For about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. After he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance for about four hundred and fifty years. After that he gave them judges until the time of the prophet Samuel. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for forty years. When he had removed him, he made David their king. In his testimony about him, he said, I have found David son of Jesse to be a man after my heart, who will carry out all my wishes. Of this man's posterity, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had already proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his work, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but one is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of the sandals on his feet. My brothers, you descendants of Abraham's family, and others who fear God, To us, the message of this salvation has been sent. Because the residents of Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize him or understand the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they fulfilled these words by condemning him. Even though they found no cause for a sentence of death, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out everything that was written about him, They took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to our ancestors he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As to his rising him from the dead, no more to return for corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy promises made to David. Therefore he has also said in another psalm, You will not let your holy one experience corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, died, was laid beside his ancestors and experienced corruption. But he whom God raised up experienced no corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, my brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. By this Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from all those sins which you could not be freed, from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Once upon a time, there were some Christians. In some ways, they were a lot like us, but in some ways, they couldn't have been more different. Like us, they lived in a great nation, a superpower even. But it was the empire of Rome in the 4th century. The thing about Rome is that contrary to its reputation among us, it's It was a very tolerant and lenient sort of empire for practical reasons. 
It's cheaper, safer, and easier to let conquered nations more or less rule themselves than it is to ship Roman generals or whatever all the way over there uh, to, to rule for them, and it's less likely to foment rebellion. So by and large, uh, as long as the conquered area demonstrated a tiny amount of, of willingness to work with Rome, Rome was more or less willing to let the people rule themselves, keep their religion, keep their form of government, burn a, a pinch of incense to the emperor, which was kind of like uh, the Pledge of Allegiance is to us, and go about your day. Worship whatever gods you want to worship. It doesn't have to be the Roman pantheon. But this, this one requirement, burn a pinch of incense to the emperor, this sacrifice, raises issues for our Christians. Because when these Christians said that Jesus is Lord, and they said that Jesus is the Son of God, what they're saying is that Caesar is not the Son of God. So sacrificing to the emperor by burning this pinch of incense to Caesar is equivalent to idolatry, equivalent to denying Christ, renouncing your faith, denying your baptism. But to the Romans, this refusal to burn the incense comes across as suspicious. It's potentially seditious. Things come to a head. And the demand is sacrifice to the emperor and hand over your scriptures to be burned or die. And we tend in these cases to focus on the people who become martyrs for understandable reasons. It's inspiring. We don't want to forget them. Uh, it teaches us something about what it looks like to live our faith in difficult situations. Uh, and we did have martyrs during this time. But you know, a lot of people obeyed. They sacrificed to the emperor. They renounced their faith. They handed over the holy books to be burned, the Bible or the letters of Paul, or whatever they had. But martyrdom always comes to an end. And this period of martyrdom comes to an end fairly quickly. Christianity becomes an officially recognized religion. And then these Christians had a problem. Some of the people who had renounced their faith to avoid persecution wanted to return to church. They wanted to join their families again, their, their church families. But the people who had suffered for their faith or who had even suffered because these other people had capitulated and maybe said names or had drawn attention to the ones who hadn't were, were reluctant, understandably, to receive these people again. And they wanted to know what theologically this betrayal meant? Did it mean that these people were now outside the church? Did they have to be baptized again? If the person who had handed over the holy scriptures and burned incense to the emperor was a preacher or a priest, was the baptisms that this preacher or priest had, uh, had administered, were they valid? Did the sin of this priest delegitimize their, the baptisms they had administered? All of these questions center around the concept of the forgiveness of sins. And I told you at the beginning that these people weren't so different from us. Just like them, we like the doctrine of the forgiveness of sins very much until it costs us too much. We like it until the sin in question seems to be a bad one. We're all for forgiving our debtors, as we say in the Lord's Prayer, until the debt in question is expensive, until it's more than we feel like we can afford. Because forgiveness costs something. I bet you know that. It's hard to live in a family very long without learning it. Your siblings, your parents, your spouse, or your friends, someone's going to hurt you. 
That's just a fact of living in the world with other people. And when we're hurt, we have two options. One, we can get rid of our pain, or at least soothe it, by trying to shove it back onto the person who gave it to us. The second option is to accept the pain without retribution. It's easy to think about using money terms. I think that's why uh, the Lord's Prayer uses money terms. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When someone hurts us, it's something like having money taken. The person who has hurt us, in some sense, owes us something. And we can demand that thing back. Think about it. Uh, when I uh, am a kid, if I'm a kid with my brothers, uh, we fought sometimes. I know it shocks you, but we did. And it didn't usually come to, to physical blows or whatever, but sometimes it did. Uh, so I bet you all who have children know this scenario, right? One kid punches the other kid. Uh, and hurts hurts them maybe more than they expected to. And the bargaining tip comes out, right? You can punch me back, just don't tell mom. There's this give and take, this economy of pain. The person who has hurt us uh, is owes us that amount of pain back. Or we can forgive the debt. And if the debt is $5 or even $50, it's easy enough to let it go. But when it's $500 or $5,000, the choice becomes more difficult. And that's not true just from the perspective of the person who's owed money. It's true from the perspective of the debtor. If we owe somebody $5 because they bought us, you know, a burger or something, that's not going to keep us up at night. And if our friend tells us not to worry about it, we're probably not going to. But if we owe that friend $5,000, it's a different story. And if someone told you not to worry about paying $5,000 back, it'd be a hard thing to accept. Our pride would get in the way. It's hard to let that feeling of obligation go. But you see how remembering that this isn't really about money, but about maybe pain, this kind of economy of pain quickly leads to slavery. You become held in bondage by the debt you owe, either because the person doesn't forgive it or because you can't accept their offer of forgiveness. You're held in bondage because somebody else owes you something and you can't let it go. It's the same thing with sin, with the ways that we rebel against God to the harm of ourselves and others. If we we perceive that what we've done isn't that big a deal. It's not a hard thing to believe in the forgiveness of sins. If I have, you know, said the Lord, taken the Lord's name in vain, for instance, right? That's in the, it's in the Ten Commandments, but we don't tend to think of it as a very serious offense, uh, which is possibly not the right way to think about this, but we talked about that earlier. The, if they break the commandment against murder, right, then it's harder to believe in the forgiveness of sins. When it's something that destroys lives, we start to wonder if forgiveness is wise or just. We start to wonder if we're capable, maybe, of holding that pain without returning it to the sender. That's the situation that these Christians found themselves in. These people, these traitors, who had capitulated to Rome to avoid the fate of those who had remained faithful who had in some cases even actively harmed their fellow believers, was it possible for them to really live in community with those people again? Could they accept the pain these people had inflicted on them without needing them to suffer in return? The same kind of slavery that threatens in the money situation rears its head here too. And since we all hurt each other in big ways or small ways, since living in relationship means to some extent living in a tangled web of hurting and being hurt, we can't really extricate ourselves from it on our own. So in today's reading, when Paul wants to preach on the forgiveness of sins, he doesn't go off on a moralistic kick. He doesn't wag his finger at us and tell us uh, that good people forgive each other. 
he doesn't tell us that forgiveness is not really for uh, the person being forgiven's sake. It's for our sake because not forgiving is bad for our souls. He doesn't say any of that. Instead, he tells a story about God's relationship with his people. He starts way back at the Exodus, when God frees the enslaved Israelites and leads them out of Egypt. And from the beginning, you can tell that this is a story of God's patience. Paul's summary of the events of Exodus is succinct. For 40 years, it says, God put up with his people in the wilderness. He was patient with them. And when they asked for kings and rejected God's system of judges, actually in the text there it says, uh, God says that they've rejected him, he gives them kings anyway. And he doesn't just give them bad kings, he gives them King David, the king after God's own heart. And he chooses, furthermore, to save the whole world through King David's descendants. Paul concludes like this. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you by this Jesus. Everyone who believes is set free from all those sins from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And in Jesus, we see just exactly what it means to forgive, as he quite literally takes all the pain and cruelty and sin of the world into himself and dies without retribution or retaliation, without opening his mouth. And then he overcomes all those things in his resurrection. He's canceled the whole debt, so to speak. He's swallowed the consequences of our wrongdoing against God. In Jesus' death and resurrection, the web of pain and hurt that had entangled the world for so long is cut, and it starts to fray. The whole thing is unraveling. Slowly, maybe, but surely, and it will all come loose in the end. Nothing we can do, nothing that can happen to us, no matter how grave or painful or serious, can ever tie that web back up again. That's the conclusion that our Roman Christians came to eventually in, in the end. Not even the betrayal of the church can undo what Christ has done. It wasn't an easy choice for them to make. It meant that they had to accept the pain that those who had complied with Rome had caused them. The choice to forgive was certainly harder than the choice to reject would have been. But in the end, what they did was add this phrase to the Apostles' Creed. We believe in the forgiveness of sins. And as Augustine of Hippo said, who lived through this whole controversy, the forgiveness of sins means that we can never despair of anyone at all. No one is out of the reach of the forgiving grace of Christ. And we who follow Christ are called to mimic him. When we forgive each other, we also suffer the consequences of other people's wrongdoings without demanding that they suffer too. When we forgive each other, we say to them and to ourselves that people mean more to God than the wrong things we do mean. In the short term, this kind of forgiving can be the more painful route. But in the long term, this is how God has chosen to heal the world. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.